Hello everybody and welcome to the English Pen Literary Salon. My name is Jane Schilling and I'm talking this afternoon to the poet and novelist Helen Dunmore. We're going to talk for about half an hour and after that there'll be about five minutes for you to ask questions. So if there's anything you want to ask Helen about her writing, this novel or um, her previous ones or her poetry or anything else um, related to her writing, then do think of some questions now. And after that, you, uh, Helen will be signing copies of her book uh, over in foils over there. Uh, so if you haven't got a copy of The Lie, okay. um, that will be your moment to get one and ask her to sign it. Um, now, Helen is the author of 10 volumes of poetry, most recently, The Malarkey. She's written numerous children's books and um, fiction for young adults, and 13 novels, including Zena and Darkness um, and A Spell in Winter, for which she won the in inaugural Orange Prize, uh, these days less wholesomely known as the Baileys. Um, her 13th novel is The Lie, which was published earlier this year. Um, the Lie is set in Cornwall in 1920, and its protagonist is Daniel Branwell, who is a very young, he's only 21, I think, mm -hmm. isn't he? Very young veteran of the First World War. Um, he's survived physically unscathed, but he's mentally scarred, and he returns to his um, childhood village um, in, a, in a state of... of um, well, he's very much damaged. He's haunted in particular by the loss yes. of his childhood friend, uh, Frederick, with whom he grew up. Um, Helen, I wanted to ask you about conflict. Conflict has informed, or it's provided the context for several of your novels. Mm -hmm. um, Zena and Darkness was set uh, in 1917. The Siege was set uh, in, in the Siege of Leningrad, as the title suggests. Um, and uh, The House of Orphans was set in Finland at a time of um, uh, great political turbulence then. Now, there's obviously you know, conflict provides narrative, um, obviously. But I wanted to ask you what you particularly f you found interesting about it. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And it's great to be here on the English Pen stand because I very much support the work that Pen does. Conflict is very much part of the experience reflected by many Pen writers. Yes. It has interested me in my entire writing life. And in the lie, to go back to something you said, we're talking about very, very young people. We're talking about veterans who are barely out of their teens. And I'm very interested in the complete immersion of these very young men in the experience of the trenches yes. and what that did to them. And then they were coming back into a home environment where their experiences could not be understood or recognized because there was no way of communicating across those two worlds. You're looking at an era before television, before radio, when people's experience of even going abroad was so limited. So Daniel, like so many young people, it's the first time he's even been beyond the county town and he goes to France, which in itself is an extraordinary thing for a person of his background to do. So I'm writing about conflict as a transforming experience and also as one which has enormous repercussions that echo and echo and echo throughout the life, the subsequent life of the veterans. That interests me very much. Um, I'm also interested uh, that in the past when you've written about um, uh, the suffering that conflict causes, it tends to have been at one remove. The people, you, your protagonists have been very much affected by conflict and involved in it, but, but on the whole they've been civilians. They haven't, 
literally been the people involved in the fighting. Daniel is, and I wondered why you wanted to explore that particular, what, what drew you to that? Was it anything to do with, with the anniversary or was it quite separate? It, it didn't begin in awareness really of the commemoration and the, and the centenary. Um, I think it's the story of my, my grandparents, probably the story of a whole generation that when I was a child was still with us, was still everywhere. And you could see, for example, if you went to France, there were seats set aside on public transport for the Mutier de la Guerre. So people who had been injured in these wars, and we took that for granted. Yes. And I think we took for granted the fact that a great uncle might have been gassed, or a grandfather might have done this or that. Or, and now all those people have gone. Their, their speaking voice is absent. We can't meet them, we can't talk to them. And maybe we regret that we didn't ask them more. Yes, because our opportunities to, to yes. have this directly from living memory are, are gone for the yes. last world war. And also, there's another thing here that I, I always felt that they didn't really want to talk. There's a silence there that I wanted to explore in my fiction, which is to do with the things that people can't say when they return from theatres of war, because either they feel that those they're speaking to won't understand it, or because they don't want to reawaken the trauma. So they would often talk about it in terms of a little jocular remark, yes. but never, oh, let me tell you my story of when I was in the trenches, or let me tell you my story when I was on a hospital ship, or people didn't do that. Um, and as you said, they, they're no longer with us. We, we can't talk to them. And yet they were so important in our culture, that generation, this massive movement of conscripted people into the battlefield. And I believe that history leaves echoes and very deep marks. And it takes us not 10 years, not 20 years, but generations to really understand an event as seismic as the First World War. And we need to understand it because our society is shaped by that. We are the product of that. Um, and that, that missing generation would have been, uh, in a sense, you have to imagine an enormous gap, like a negative space. As you say in, in art, when you're drawing, you're not just drawing what's there, you're also drawing what's not there, you're drawing the spaces. And maybe that's something that fiction does. It draws what isn't there. It draws what can't be talked about. It makes you see those things. At least I believe so. Yes, that's very interesting. We were talking just before we started about the way that fiction turns chaos into patterns, weren't, weren't we? Yes. Um, yes. Um, something else which isn't very much discussed, in a way, is friendship, male friendship. Now, Daniel, when he returns to his village, is, is almost utterly bereft. His father has died when he's very small, when he's three. His mother has died while he's away at war. Um, he knows almost no one, and he has lost um, the person who really was probably the most important to him of all, his friend, Frederick. Now, that's quite an unlikely friendship, isn't it? Tell us about that. In a way, it is an unlikely friendship because there's a huge, huge difference of background between these two young men. One comes from a prosperous family. They've made their money in mining engineering down, down in Cornwall. And Daniel is a, a child who's been fatherless and has had to leave school very early in order to go to a job as a gardener's boy and to to bring in a wage to help his mother. And again, I feel this is completely typical of a whole generation. Um, and, and we forget often that the opportunities that we have for education were not shared by our grandparents. Mm -hmm. Clever as they were, gifted as they were, they did not have those opportunities. Um, so Daniel is a boy who loves books and is hungry. And Almost comically, his friend Frederick, who gets sent to a very good school, 
doesn't really find it interesting and he, he doesn't really enjoy it at all. Whereas Frederick is almost sitting here thinking, I've got to learn this stuff and Daniel is snatching the books out of his hand. And I, I found that quite interesting. But the relationship between them is a very profound relationship because Daniel has protected and shielded his friend. There's a lot of unkindness, even brutality in this richer, more prosperous family. And so Daniel and Frederick, have be, they, they've sworn a blood brotherhood, as little boys often do, you know. They, and they shield and they defend and they support each other. And it goes right back to early childhood. And I'm very interested in friendships between men because it's a, it's a, it's a very compelling subject, what these bonds that go right through life. And it, in the case of going to the trenches, Daniel explores bonds also with the people in his platoon, the people in his company. Um, and it was an entirely male world, really, when you went up the line. Obviously, you had women in field hospitals, you had women in the YMCA and so forth, but you did not have women up the line. So you have this entirely male world, which I wanted to write about, uh, and a world of conflict, but also a world of great solidarity and, you know... I mean, male friendship is a subject with, with which, I mean, for example, Victorians were entirely at ease having somebody like Hallam and uh, Tennyson and, and, and Arthur Hallam. And, and Daniel says of Frederick, if ever I was going to be myself, I needed him. Nowadays, it's a subject that we find difficult to discuss without its shading into some other context. I mean, that of kind of tribal relationships like football or indeed homoeroticism. And there is a, there's a kiss in this book, but it's, but it's not, it's not, there's not really an ambiguity over the friendship particularly. It's just a very close male bond, isn't it? It is. And in fact, it's the closest, it's probably the closest effective relationship in either of their lives, though they don't fully that's realize true. It's that. As well as yes, yeah. they, they don't fully realize that. And that's probably why they are so, so close. And yet it, such a friendship isn't recognized quite by social ties. You know, you, 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 it would be easier for people to understand Daniel's sense of devastation. And yet again and again and again, soldiers talk about the loss, the loss of a best friend, the loss of a buddy, the loss of a mate, being the thing that has almost finished them and that they have thought about for years afterwards and haven't been able to come to terms with. And there's also the survivor feeling of, could I have done more? Should I have done more? Could I have saved this? You know, if there's been a situation where one is wounded or could I have rescued the situation and people punished themselves for a long time. But I wanted also to show the warmth and the tenderness and the humor and the sparkle of friendship as well, not just the, the darker side of it. This is true. I mean, it's a, it's a book, although it's a, a book of great sadness, it's also a book with passages of great kind of lyrical sweetness um, as well. Um, but just, <laughs> just return to the shadow side for a moment. Um, when Daniel returns he there is a sort of ghostliness about him because of the loss of frederick it's almost as though he's a he's a shadow of himself and and he suffers or not suffers he 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 experiences very strong intimations almost hallucinations of frederick um and at this time, post First World War, there was a very strong spiritualism. I mean, there was a very strong sense of slippage between the ghost world, the world of the dead, and the world of the living. I mean, people were very much into trying to contact. I think in the novel, somebody tries to contact her nephew via a Ouija board. Yes. Um, and this sense of slippage between the temporal and the spiritual is 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 just something of a theme in your in your other some of your other books as well. And and I wondered if you would tell us about that. It's very true that, particularly after the First World War, there was an upsurge in people trying to contact the dead. And I can entirely see why, because if you think about it, you have a son, maybe 18, or you have a brother, or you have a young husband, or as the war progressed, not so young, you know, they were taking older and older people. But 
they just disappeared and they were never brought back again. It was decided not to repatriate the dead, so that didn't happen. And then there was this disappearance that you had to deal with and people couldn't accept it. They, there were, a lot of people give evidence of expecting a knock on the door or expecting to hear a voice. And certainly mediums, some of them fraudulent, clairvoyants, Ouija boards, ectoplasm, people were taking advantage of it as well. And R Robert Graves tells the story and goodbye to all that of waking up to hear this terrible kind of sobbing shriek, which was supposed to be a spirit. Um, but I am interested because it seemed to me that in some ways the barrier between the dead and the living was almost dissolving. That you were, so, you were living so close to death as a young soldier yes. that you often counted your acquaintance among the dead was greater than your acquaintance among the living. I and think I Cynthia think, Asquith says exactly that, mm, doesn't she, in her yes. diaries at the time? Yes, to, yes. Yeah. A, a, and you have all these friends who have died, and therefore your whole view of death becomes quite different. Because I wanted to write about young people in their vigor and their vitality, because you remember, I mean, I remember at 18 or 19, you have this overwhelming sense of vitality and being alive, and that does weaken through the course of your life. But if you are suddenly torn out of life, or you see a friend or a comrade torn out of life, it does seem against reason and against nature. And there's a lot of anger in, there's a lot of anger in the book, looking back and looking at what has happened to all those people. And they haven't even had decent burials and they've just been lost. Some of them are just the missing, the lost. Um, so, that sense of two worlds and of th there's no comfortable sense of, well, I'll grow old and then I'll die. Yes. It's not going to be like that. Yes. I'm very interested in, in, in this book and, and indeed in your other books about the role that landscape plays in the land. I mean, in the lie, uh, the vigor that you were just talking about um, is, is very much represented by, uh, represented by the land. Daniel comes home, he takes over um, a, a tiny small holding belonging mm -hmm. to an old woman who's, who's befriended him. And, um, uh, and um, there's a sense in which he's almost beginning to recover. He plants seeds, they grow. Mm -hmm. uh, he seems to be about to achieve peace of mind. But then at the same time, mud is a metaphor for absolute destruction and chaos. And mud is the smell of death on the, the kit on Fred Frederick's kit when it's sent back and on, on, on the wife of uh, his uh, sister Felicia's husband is also being killed and his kit stinks of mud and, and so there's a, a sense of the land as both orderly and a metaphor for, as, as, as a metaphor for something that endures but also as a metaphor for death and yes. chaos. Well Daniel is quite typical of his generation in a way because there was a big smallholder movement after the First World War and he, I, I very much wanted him to have a desire to, to live, to progress in his life, to survive. So there's this drive. At the same time, he's being pulled back. And he's, he's competent. He's good at doing things. Um, he's very handy. He's he? handy. He's very handy. He's been a gardener's boy and then has progressed through that career throughout his teens. So he knows what he's doing. And I wanted that to be very real in the book, the growing the seeds, the different seeds, how things grow, how the land produces. Um, it's not a metaphor, it's a real concrete thing. Um, and he's trying to snatch something back from all this loss that he's had. And yet at the same time, the earth, it isn't wholly benign because he's been, like all these men, we forget how much they lived in the open. And when they came back on leave, they would be burnt by the sun and, and tanned, and they often looked extremely healthy because and they like were farmers, really. Yes, the because the they were living outdoors a lot of the time, and they were in the open. Um, so, I wanted to suggest that he's been in a place which is quite outside any previous human experience, and then he comes back and he does something that people have always done, which is start with the soil, grow, build up a life, build a shelter, clean yourself, 
and try and make, try and make at least subsistence. And it's very, very difficult. Um, but I, loved, I love writing about the detail of his world that he's trying to make. Uh, and I felt it had to be very, very real. Yes, and it is. God, I long to ask you more, really, about your writing generally, but time is short. Um, so I'd just like to ask you, um, Car Carol Ruman said something interesting uh, about your writing. She said that you have a radical sense of wanting to redeem women's experiences. And I wonder what you thought she meant by that, and whether you think it's possible to make any kind of useful or interesting distinction between the different ways that men and women write or, or the way in which their writing is seen, perhaps, by other people, critics and readers? Huh, that's a big question, isn't it? It is too big a question. Mm, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think things have changed a great deal just in my writing career, in fact, because when I began publishing poetry, which was back when I was 21 or 22, it was a small field as far as women went and that had two um, consequences. One was that your work probably received a bit more attention and the others were that you tended to be seen very much as a woman writer. Possibly that has changed now or is changing in that we, we don't have a small field of women poets, for example. We have a very large yes. field. Um, what Carol Ruman said there about redeeming women's experience. I think I'm also trying to write about daily experience in a very strong light, if I can put it that way. So when I wrote The Siege, I wanted to focus on this small civilian family, almost like an encampment on a dark plain, really, and how they live, how they survive in every detail. And it, I found the detail. Um, and perhaps one of the things I do want to bring back or, or redeem is that exactitude of the taste, the smell, the texture, the touch, so that my characters don't live in their heads. They live in all their senses. Because to me, that's how people do live. Yes. And I find if you're just trapped in a whirl of thought all the time, that seems un yes. um, untruthful. Now, um, we've just briefly got time for a couple of questions. So is there anybody who would like to? Yes. Um, yep. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask about the types of genres that you write in. Obviously, you write under the same name. Um, I write children's fiction I have some ideas for adult novels as well and you've always you've been an inspiration to me the fact that you're able to write in both of those so I just wonder how you um, cope with switching between the two as much as you know why you chose to perhaps keep your name for both things mm. or all the projects that you do thank you that's a very interesting point because it, it, it never occurred to me that it was possible to have more than one name. And maybe I'll work on that. Um, I can see it could be good. It could be good. You could really spread yourself. Um, but I, I, I suppose I don't probably think about it that, that consciously in a way. I began my um, writing life writing poetry and that is not something you ever abandon and one of the things that gave me as a novelist was pitch the sense of hearing the line and also hearing the way people speak because if if you're a, a poet you measure the rhythm a lot and if if something has a false rhythm you discard it another thing i get from poetry is discarding things because you would expect to be very ruthless as a poet. You would expect to go through 30, 40 drafts. And I would expect to go through a lot of drafting as a novelist. And I find it, when I have done creative writing, teaching, or master classes, to, to, to help people not to be afraid of throwing things away and not to feel that you'll lose anything by doing that. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting, but to me, I think it's the sound of writing. 
that is common throughout all my... Uh, I, the, the pitch probably is the common factor. Somebody else? Uh, lady in front. Oh, there's a microphone coming. Just hang on a sec. <laughs> I'd like to ask about research, how you go about that for each novel. Question about research. Um, I think research is a, quite a trap, really, for a novelist because it's very enjoyable and rather seductive. And it's much more... It, it's very easy for me to get, oh, well, I've just got to make one more little journey or I've just got to read some more things or go here or go there. Um, and there comes a point where I find I have to start writing and then something will come up and I'll think, I don't know that. Um, so now the way I, I, I do it, I, I, I will mark the text and I will, this is a point I've got to go back to rather than say, I've got everything gathered before I begin. Because even if you think you have, you haven't. Um, and it's also easy to be a writer who researches, but not so easy to be a writer who writes the first draft, so it's uh, <laughs> got to watch it. Mm. Yes. You're a poet and a novelist. Um, some poets say that when they write prose, their poetry dries up and the poems don't come. I wonder if that happens to you and how you manage to keep writing both of them. The other thing that didn't used to happen in the past is that people these days can tend to pigeonhole and some poets feel if they write a novel, they're not considered a proper poet anymore because people like to pigeonhole her. So I wonder if you have ideas on that. Oh, maybe there is pigeonholing, but in, in, in my experience, more and more poets are moving into, for example, fiction or radio drama or other, for, other forms. I mean, somebody like Owen Shears, for example, who does a lot of television work and a lot of kind of cross-genre work. I believe his first work, published work was poetry. So I don't think it's too hidebound. Um, at least I hope not. And in fact, it seems to me that more and more poets are realizing that if you can, if you can write poetry, you've got a very fine instrument and maybe you could use that instrument in another way. You know, it would be like, you, you don't only have to play a sonata, you know, you can do other things. Um, so so I, I say also, what really amused me was when I first started writing fiction, the number of the people I knew who were poets who would kind of sidle up and say, <laughs> how do you go about that? You know, how, how does that work? Because poets earn so little money and it really can be very difficult over a lifetime, which is why I'm pleased that a lot of poets are now getting professorships um, in creative writing, because it's a very tough, it's a very tough world where you have to do readings and appearances all the time. Uh, and David Constantine, for example, fantastic short stories. He, 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 he began his work only as a poet, and he's very equally well regarded as a short story writer now. So there's many examples. Oh, I'm sorry that we've run out of time, but thank you very much, thank you, Helen. Jane. And um, do go and talk to Helen some more in the Foils Bookshop. Thank you.